Would you like to become a chess master? If so, then you've come to the right place. I'm Grandmaster Max Zillingworth. I am also a certified high performance coach. And the purpose of this training video is to share with you the four key things. How many four key things that you need to do in order to become a chess master, no matter what your situation is. And if you're wondering where do these four things come from, they come from a combination of scientific and academic research in how people master skills. And I also have been borne out by my own experience and the experience of other chess players that I have observed. And is it all right if I tell you a little bit more about myself and my personal journey? Great. So basically, I remember what it was like for me when I was a junior chess player. I started playing chess at six. I started getting really serious at eight to nine years of age. I worked with a lot of different chess coaches and titled chess players. Now, I've been experiencing a lot of really great coaching, but it wasn't always so easy for me as it might seem on the outside as a chess grandmaster. Uh, the reality is that 2007 was a year where it was a big breakthrough for me. From 2005, 2006, I was stuck at this 1800 level for two years. And let me tell you, it was very frustrating because I was putting a lot of time and a lot of effort into my chess, but somehow it wasn't showing in my results. I was having stupid losses to low rate players who I kind of knew deep down that I was sort of better than, but somehow wasn't showing. And then also when I was playing high rated players, I would just seem to lose without a fight and just play really, really stupidly sometimes. Um, so that was very frustrating also to see these other players around my age who were just gaining hundreds of rank points, like just seeming to jump from 1800 to 2000 or 1900 to nearly 2200. Well, I was stuck at this 1800 level wondering, you know, what is going wrong here. And there were some things that I changed in order to have that big breakthrough year in 2007. Uh, some of the things I did, for example, were I started to work on my chess a lot more intelligently. I started to not only improve my raw chess skill, but also work on myself as a person in order to make the most of my ability. Uh, I also started just really training much more effectively, really putting more serious effort and more deliberate practice rather than just relying on playing to improve. And that was sort of a, just a lot of big shifts. Obviously, I could talk about this for many hours. And if you have watched some of my YouTube videos before, then you may have heard some of the story already. But I think it's quite a powerful one to show how the greatest improvements come when we get the right help that we need. And when we start following an actual system that gets us those results. Now, looking back, I realized that, you know, I went from a rating of a national rank of 1967 to 2,303 in 12 months. And in that same time, my FIDE rating, that is in national rating, went from 2,000 to 2,250 ish. But then there was another two years after that where I didn't really progress much at all. I was just stuck and had to work through a lot of different challenges, especially on a psychological level and a mental kind of level that was really holding me back. And then when I finally did overcome those challenges, I suddenly just had this massive improvement and seemed to become a FIDE master almost overnight, it seemed, from just two or three really good tournaments. Uh, and again, nearly 100 rating points in this period of late 2009 to early 2010. And that was actually while I was doing my final year of high school, when I didn't have a lot of time on my hands. So it goes to show that if I can make these big improvements while balancing high school, while balancing mental illness within my family and my own personal anxiety and some struggles in high school, it shows that it's possible for you as well, because it's not really a question of things like talent. It's just a matter of doing the right things for long enough to become a chess master. So good or good? Are you ready to find out what these right things are? Well, I like to call it the formula for, uh, for chess mastery. And I know that formula for some people, maybe it has a, a negative connotation, like, oh, it's just, you know, like an assembly line of, okay, you know, you missed a five, six, seven, seven, six, five, go in there, do step one, do step two, do step three, do step four, and boom, you're a master at the end. But I can assure you that my process is very different to that. 
But nonetheless, by understanding the key principles of what it takes to become a master, we can then adapt it to find the way that's right for you, good or good. So here are the four steps for, or the formula rather, for chess mastery, just from the general perspective of mastering a skill. The first one is practice. Okay, you're probably thinking, well, Max, this is absolutely groundbreaking stuff. It never occurred to me that practice was the key to becoming a chess master. But okay, more serious note, it is, there's obviously a lot of different ways in which you can practice, right? And I see so many chess players where they say, oh, I really want to improve. You know, I've gone through all of Cyrus Lakdawala's book cover to cover, and I didn't laugh on every single page because I was taking it seriously. Or maybe a situation of, oh, you know, I'm going through this work with this different private chess coach, you know, working an hour a week and, you know, he's giving me homework and this and that and this and that. Or you know, I have a million resources, like I still have to get through this, I still have to get through that, and then I'm going to be a master. Sound familiar? So what is the element that you think is missing with someone who has this kind of approach and that will explain why their rating is still the same two or three years later? It's because they're not actually implementing the skills that they are learning. And we're going to get to the element of skill mastery later, but basically the key, the first key, it makes sense to get good at chess, you got to practice it. So that means playing lots and lots of chess games. Of course, not just playing for the sake of it. Of course, we should also learn the right lessons from our chess games, right? Because otherwise we're just repeating the same mistakes and that doesn't really help either. But if you're not at least practicing the skills that you're learning, then you're going to kid yourself into thinking you've got the knowledge and you understand things better. But then when push comes to shove and you're playing the game, your results still haven't improved. And and I get that. You know, I've read, gone through over a thousand chess books and magazines and periodicals cover to cover. And I get that frustration of putting a lot of time in and not seeing any results. Because like, I know you're watching this video because you love chess. Chess is a big passion for you and it's important for you to get better. But if you're not seeing any progress, then something that previously you absolutely loved, it gets kind of tiring pretty quickly, right? Maybe your situation is, oh, no, it's fine, Max. I'm okay with, you know, not ever improving at chess. Like, I'm happy where I am. If so, this is not the, the video or the training for you. But if you are serious about, you know, getting that progress and if this resonates with you, then let's continue on this great path. You know, have already taken that step and shown that courage to try to find a better way than what you've been doing before because chances are if what you were doing was going to lead you to the master title, you probably would have got there by now, right? So let me share with you then step two of the element of skill mastery. Actually, before I do, I will mention with the practice element, I was playing lots and lots of Blitz on, uh, at that time was in that chess club, but now more recently chess.com. And just that experience of playing lots and lots of strong players, even in a fast time control, does help you to improve your chess. So by practice, I don't just mean playing the classical tournaments, but even the faster time controls can help you a lot. Again, provided you actually learn something from the games, which of course is uh, not as hard as people think, actually. But I do have a system to help with that. Should you join my coaching program, we will you will learn exactly how that all works and how to do it for yourself. But let's get into the second element of chess mastery. First one is practice, and the second one is skill mastery. So what exactly do we mean by skill mastery specifically? Well, this means that we break down the different chess skills that a chess master has, and you know, you can think of many of them coming to mind, like openings, middle games, end games, tactics, calculation, positional play, strategy. You probably come up with some others as well, right? If you try hard enough, but this is the general you know, outline of different chess skills. Uh, and, you know, some might use different words like understanding instead of, say, positional strategic play. Uh, but you get the, the general idea, right? Uh, also, I guess we could add practical play as another kind of element to that as well, uh, which fits more to making the most of your current ability, which we will get into a bit later in this video. But before I do, let's talk about the skill mastery component. And it's well noticed in a lot of cases that sometimes to become a better chess player, sometimes it's just as simple as practicing a particular skill until it becomes kind of automatic. This is how uh, it happened with one of the recent success stories, actually, where I had this student, or I have this student actually uh, named Michael. And Michael is this guy in Germany. He's right about 1850-ish on FIDE and on the German UWZ rating. 
And so what I did was I actually went through this boot camp with him where I went through the key, the 10 key chess skills. I broke down in those 10 key areas and worked through it individually with him. And then while he was actually going through that boot camp, he already was getting some improvement in his results, you know, drawing with Fide Master in daily chess twice, also beating some 2000 players more often where previously he would just get crushed by them. But then the big breakthrough happened after going through the full process, which was only about 10 hours of sessions, but just in that time, that really focused work, doing the right things every day for long enough, he was able to have a performance rating in the Lee Chess League uh, of any plate of 2468, saying his Lee Chess rating was about 2000 to 100 to give an idea, and he just won every single one of his games and performed way above his rating as such. So it shows the difference that it makes when you do master the skills, It'll also make you a lot more confident, and then the improvement is going to come from there. Yes or yes. And so, when it comes to skill mastery, this is using a different kind of practice to just, you know, practicing like playing games and, you know, analyzing the games. It's what we call deliberate practice. And now, if you have studied different books, such as the Malcolm R. Gladwell Atlee's book, then you'll probably understand this concept of deliberate practice already. You know, he also famously said the 10,000 hours to mastery concept, which admittedly is perhaps not so true in, in reality, but it gives an idea for, uh, you know, for people who don't understand that process to become a master. Uh, nonetheless, the thing with deliberate practice is it's not just, you know, reading a book for the sake of it or like randomly solving puzzles on Puzzle Rush, but deliberate practice is actually using your head to ask questions and to answer questions as opposed to just flicking through books or using the engine blindly, which is what I used to do. And when you do such things, it kind of makes your head a bit lazy. Yes or yes. Where you just think, oh, I can always turn on the engine. It will give me the answer. Then you sit at the board and, you know, you realize that you're not allowed to turn on the engine while playing your chess game. And so it becomes much harder to figure it out for yourself, right? Uh, or you find a situation where you kind of read some book and that book gives you that false feeling that competency that you kind of know the topic, but because you didn't actually solve enough puzzles to actually practice that thinking technique, or, you know, you didn't make the effort to actually apply it consciously in your own games to the actual techniques for thinking, then the result is that it just didn't lead to any real improvement. Maybe you understand the Grandmaster games a tiny bit better when you look through them live, but other than that, no real change, yeah? Because it's one thing to know something intellectually, it's a whole thing, different matter entirely, to be able to implement it successfully in your own games, true or true. And so that's where the skill mastery really comes in with deliberately practicing the skill, asking questions, answering questions in order to be able to apply it as well as possible in your own games. So that's how the skill mastery works. And of course, as part of this, you know, it definitely is a good idea to leverage existing resources. There are many examples like books, videos, websites, chess servers, and databases, and so on and so forth. I guess we could add coaching as well as a good one too. But at the same time, the thing is that I know that for many people, and this was true for me also, by the way, uh, and even as a grandmaster, it was kind of true for me at times. There's so many different chess resources out there that I feel that it's very easy to get kind of lost in, you know, what to do or how to do it. And it can also be very easy to feel overwhelmed, right? When one grandmaster says, oh, you need to do this. Another says, oh, no, you need to do this. A third one says, oh, do it this way. And, you know, have all these different voices. And so what really is a key part of getting to the master level, in my experience, and this is going beyond the, the skill mastery part, is to basically trust the process. If there's one single bit of advice I have to, let's say, give you on the more, let's say, mindset, psychological level of the journey to mastery, the key is to trust the process. The thing is, it's very hard to trust a process that is just, you know, cookie cutter. Oh, here's a bunch of material. Go ahead and, you know, good luck. Obviously, it's very hard to trust that because then it's not necessarily addressing the challenges as specific to your situation, right? And so that's one thing that's very different with my process is that it's a very clear system, but it's also very flexible and individualized to give you that one-on-one -on -one support as you need it. And of course, yeah, when we get on the call as well, that's also going to be an example where you'll get to experience that and feel how, what a difference is working with like certified high performance coach versus some GM that says, say, oh, this is what I did when you're in your situation, do the same thing and you'll get master, which maybe sounds good in theory, but you'll quickly realize that your path is going to be a little bit different. 
but we're here to help you every step of the way, good or good. Which actually leads us into the third, uh, the third element. Um, there was actually one element of, uh, of skill mastery I will mention just quickly about how to use the puzzles most effectively, because I do want to give you at least one actionable step to follow from this video, and that is that basically when it comes to solving puzzles, most people do it the wrong way, whether it's solving puzzle rush or just solving random kind of puzzles. The most effective way to solve puzzles, and this based on my own experience of what led to the greatest improvement for me, is A, solve puzzles as much as possible with a similar kind of theme. If you have one puzzle, let's say, with one tactical theme and one with a completely different one, the next one's a calculation, next an endgame study, next is positional or strategic, well, then it's kind of training your mind to, let's say, go in all sorts of random directions, almost like you're a kid on, you know, has ADHD and you can't focus on one thing, right? But if you do focus on that one thing, and if it comes to, if there is one single word that I have to say is what determines success or what determines mastery, it really is focus. And focus has a lot of levels. We're going to talk about that more in the call to help you understand how that relates and how to apply that laser focus for your situation. But in terms of chess puzzles, that's really the key. That it's very important to focus on a theme and really practice that specific thinking process. And I know that there are some people who say, but Max, if I know what the theme is, then the puzzles get kind of easy. And, you know, I feel like I'm wasting my time because the puzzle too easy. But that's the whole point. Wouldn't you much rather be able to automatically do that tech, that thinking technique so it's just automatic and you're able to see it and solve it right away the way top grandmasters can? I mean, imagine how awesome would that superpower be? I mean, with that, you could actually beat top grandmasters if you mastered it for all of the chess skills, right? Now, of course, I understand that, you know, your situation is a little bit different, but just imagine, like, how just one still mastery, whether that's, you know, mastering some different tactical theme that you've often been missing or mastering some calculation technique that you maybe knew of before, but you just had no idea how to apply it. And now you just switched on like, yep, I see that. I see that. I see that. Like almost you don't have to think about it. You just see it, you know, kind of like, uh, what be a good example, like Neo in the, the Matrix, like just sort of seeing everything just as it is rather than laying all the different perceptions cloud in a sense. Okay, perhaps I could use a better metaphor, but I think you get the picture of, you know, like I was blind and now I can see. In any case, that's sort of the element for solving the puzzles to solve them by theme and also to repeat the same puzzle sets because uh, one of the greatest star names in uh, personal development, Tony Robbins, once said that repetition is the mother of skill mastery. And with the chess puzzles, a pretty obvious example that when you're solving the puzzles for a second time or a third time, it's going to be much faster and much easier than the first time, right? And that means also when you see similar patterns come up in a game, you're just going to see it automatically. You're almost not going to have to think about it when it comes to that particular technique. It'll just become clear right away. So that is how chess can become easier for you. Wouldn't that be really cool? So that's one way, yeah, to be struggling a lot less in your chess thought process. Let's now dive into the third key component. And this is one that I kind of neglected at first in the early in my chess journey, and I sort of had to figure it out almost out of necessity. And at that time, I didn't have the resources or the understanding, you know, as a teenager that I have now. And well, I guess it's part of why I'm here as well, you know, for, you know, helping people get to chess master level. Like for me, it's not even, I think, mostly about the result of like getting you to that result. But I think for me, what I find most rewarding is seeing how much you grow and evolve as a person on the way to gain that master title, because that's something you can take with you anywhere. Yes or yes. And it's kind of hard to put it into words, because if you haven't gone through that journey, it's kind of hard to understand it. You know, I can tell you different stories, like, for example, how I overcame anxiety and panic attacks, or how I realized that my environment, you know, of my family struggling a bit financially, and my dad having, you know, severe depression, how that our kids bullying me at school, like how that didn't have to define the path that I was going on as such, that I could choose my own path and I could find my own inner strength when struggles came up or when nothing seemed to be going right in school, for example. So, but the thing, I can tell you those stories, but until you experience yourself, that's when like the, when you'll kind of fully get it. But that's what I mean about like trusting a process. I like, just trust that all the struggle you've been through 
and maybe all the things where you're like, oh, I wish I had done this, or, you know, I wish I had done that. Just trust that it's been preparing you to be able to make the most of this moment that you have right now, where you still have time to make that improvement in your chess, where, you know, it's not too late for you to become a chess master. And, you know, that's just the message I want to share, you know, the opportunity is still there. The mistakes you made before are just meaning that now that you do have this opportunity to do the right things in the right way, that you can make the most of it as such. Uh, so that being said, the third element of self-mastery, I do want to explain this a bit more, but it's basically in a sense, you could say almost kind of like conquering oneself, kind of knowing yourself very well, uh, finding your own solutions to different challenges. Because again, one thing that is very different about my coaching process compared to almost anything else I've seen in the chess world, and you know, this isn't something I just came up with, you know, while meditating one day, but this is something I actually learned from certifying as a high performance coach in 2019. And that is something I do recertify every single year to make sure that my coaching practices and my coaching approach is completely up to date and totally like scientifically and academically the right way to go about things. So, you know, I put that that research in to help you as much as possible. Um, but in terms of the self-mastery component, basically I call it using high performance to develop the habits that masters follow consistently so that you too can become a chess master. Now, one thing I kind of only remembered quite recently is that being a chess master in itself doesn't automatically make you a high performer. Because a lot of people, when they hear high performance, they think like, oh, sacrificing everything, you know, like, oh, don't talk to any people, you know, put yourself in a, I don't know, almost like in a prison for a year and come out a chess master beating everybody. You know, maybe some people think it's like this. But that's kind of an eye of an awe thinking. And, you know, maybe it's this sort of thinking that might have also been holding you back in some ways, thinking, well, I can do this or this, and not having the benefit of coaching that shows you that there are often way more options available than what you might realize to be able to overcome a different challenge. Yes or yes. And so the definition of high performance, just so you're able to not only become a chess master, but actually really enjoy the journey and to really grow as a person and you know, just have that internal satisfaction of knowing that you're doing the right things and that you are taking the right lessons from the experiences, is that high performance is consistently succeeding beyond standard norms over the long term without sacrificing your personal well-being and relationships. And I think in terms of considering high performance, I know it's maybe a bit of a new concept to, to some of you, but I would describe it in the most concise way as being like a feeling. And there are actually three specific things that high performance feels like so that you can judge for yourself whether you are kind of in that high performance state, you know, in your chess games, in your training, even just in your general life, uh, or at least to know how to move towards it and where you might be lacking. So the first feeling of high performance is engagement. So that means being totally present and 100% absorbed from a competitive psychology perspective, you might know this as being in the zone or in being in flow uh, based on the research by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. However, what this means for you is basically to have this hyper focus that comes from basically just doing the best that you can in the moment and being your very best self in, uh, in that time. And the result is that this allows you to get more done in less time. Because, you know, I get it that for many chess players like you, maybe you're balancing you know, full-time job or perhaps study and also balancing, you know, spending time with your family, whether that's your parents or your know, wife, children. You know, I get that. You know, I'm also married and living with my parents. So also it's a reminder of me, you know, that it's not best to spend 16 hours a day on, you know, recording these videos. And then, you know, my wife is saying you spend more time on a computer than, than with her or something. So I get that. But the thing is with the element of being productive, it's not about necessarily trying to get as much done as possible, but it's about getting the maximum results from, let's say, the time that you have, right? Uh, you might know of a principle known as the Pareto principle, which is that 80% of your results are going to come from the top 20% of your actions, right? And that's really where the coaching is very, very powerful. It allows you to really focus on that top uh, 20% of things that will give you the 80% of the results rather than doing it the way I did when I didn't know better, where I was, you know, spending in like the 80% of the time to get the 20% of the results. 
And yeah, I got to Grandmaster because I just kept, you know, pushing out for a sheer persistence for long enough. But if I had been balancing a full-time job while on this journey the whole way, and, you know, also, let's say, had been busy, like, with some relationships and this kind of thing, and had other competing interests, then honestly, I probably wouldn't have got to Grandmaster. It was my hyper-focus and being very intentional and effective in how I used my time that allowed me to get there at the age of 23. And it's true, if I had known then what I know now, I maybe would have got there at 18 instead with how productive I, I was. But, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Yes, so yes. And it's so easy to look back in hindsight and say, yeah, I would have done this differently, this differently, that differently. But I don't regret it because that means I'm now in a position to tell you the things that I would have done or I would do if I were to relive that journey all the way back from the very beginning with the knowledge that I have now. And that's why I want to really kind of impress upon you about, you know, working with me that, yeah, you might be tempted to count, oh, I get this many hours here, that many hours there, I think in a very transactional kind of way. But it's not about the hours from my program. My focus is on the results that I get you specifically. Does that sound good? I mean, wouldn't you agree that it would be much better to get to the chess master level in 90 days, that that would be much more valuable for you than if you got there in one year or or in five years, right? You know, the speed is obviously a, a big value of this, right? And that's what I know. I know how to get there a lot faster because I've been through that process. I've made all those mistakes. I've gone through the pain of when I've screwed up and not known how to get out of the, the challenge I find myself in and you're having to figure it out. But the point is that I'm here to be able to help you figure it out and actually guide you uh, through that process. Yeah, something dropped on the ground there, but okay, we are used to adapting things on the fly. You know, chess players, we know how to, to be adaptable and flexible in the face of different challenges, right? In any case, that's sort of talking a bit about the element of self-mastery. And as you can see, I'm very passionate about this. I, I can talk about something for hours and then I remember, okay, there's something else I got to tell you, right? Um, so the first element of uh, the feeling of high performance is engagement. Uh, the second one is joy. You know, when you're enjoying the process, you're just going to be much more successful and just going to learn a lot better. So I do really try to make the process more fun. Like you can tell even, this is like I tell a few stories, maybe make a few little jokes just to kind of make it more interesting and, and fun for you. So that's very important for me to like make the learning process as enjoyable and exciting for you as possible. And of course, I'm going to be challenging you as well, but you're actually going to enjoy the challenge. Like, oh, now I'm improving as a person or, oh, this is going to allow me to rise up. Because like when you overcome the challenge, it's such a great feeling, right? Like, okay, I conquered something that I didn't think I could before. It was very, very satisfying. I say this from my own experience as well. Uh, and the third element of, of high performance or more precisely the third feeling of high performance after engagement and joy is confidence. And basically... Going through this process of becoming a chess master is just going to make you so much more confident in everything that you do. And by confidence, I don't mean sort of this false, like, macho, like, yeah, I'm confident. Look at me. I'm Mr. Confident. But it comes from a very genuine place of knowing that you'll always be able to figure things out, uh, or at least reach out and get help in order to figure things out. That's really where true confidence comes from. Confidence in your ability to figure things out, whatever the problem is, that you'll be able to find a solution or you'll be able to get help from someone who can guide you towards that solution, if not share that solution directly with you that works for you. So that's the element of confidence and it's just going to, yeah, allow you to also become much more competent. You might have heard something called the confidence competence loop, but if not, I'll explain briefly that what this means is that when you are more confident, you put yourself out there a lot more. A concrete example, I was working with a student actually in this coaching program very recently, and he wasn't sure whether to play this blitz tournament or not. He was fear afraid of failing, but because he put himself out there, I coached him through the process to help him actually make that step and play. Once he did that, he gained a lot more confidence because like, okay, the tournament wasn't that great, but I learned a lot about myself and I know what to work on now. And that in turn leads to more competency, right? where now he's like working on different skills and getting that improvement in those results. And then as you get more competent, you're like, okay, I can actually do this now. You know, I can actually beat those two 200 players or, you know, I can actually start to draw with those FIDE masters. And then that also gives you a lot more confidence. Like, okay, I beat them before I can beat them again and I can beat them again. And then it just becomes like a normal part of who you are to beat such players. Like it doesn't, 
feel like anything special anymore in a funny sort of way. Like, I mean, in a positive, because I had the same experience in 2007 when I was playing lots and lots of Blitz on Internet Chess Club, you know, practicing my openings. As, well, I guess how I was doing it. There weren't a lot of tournaments over the board in Australia, right? So I was getting good games by practicing my openings online. And so I reached a point where, you know, I suddenly started beating these international masters. Like, this is so cool. I beat him before so I could beat him again. And I got so much confidence that if I was playing an IM, I just was winning most of the time when playing him in Blitz. And you know, then I started to get my first wins against Grandmasters. Like, well, it wasn't just a fluke. Like, I actually outplayed them in the game. I thought, okay, this is pretty cool. I can do that again. And so I started being him more often and more often. And you know, before I knew it, my FIDE Blitz strength was like 2,500 plus, And I was... You know, I had a FIDE rank of 2150, but because my Blitz was at a Grandmaster level, I knew that in my next Classical Tournament, if I played some IM or GM, I could at least draw with them, maybe even beat them, even in a Classical game. And, you know, my next Tournament, 2008 Australian Championship, I actually proved it, where, you know, I beat a International Master Raid 2400. I beat a FIDE Master who was very nearly 2400 and actually became an IM one year after that tournament. And I also, you know, drew with a you know, an IM who was raid nearly, who was raid 2450 and went on to win the Australian Championship title. And, and I was actually one move off beating him, you know, I was so close. And with the black pieces too. And then against the one GM in the tournament, I managed to draw with him with the black pieces as well. And so it was just a really, it was a really great feeling, like having that personal breakthrough. It was even more than just the result. It was just knowing that I had conquered like the challenges that were holding me back before. Like I wasn't cracking under the pressure anymore. I knew how to really become a master, like how to actually become an expert at something. Because that's something, once you go through the process once, it's so much easier to do it the second time with a second skill, third skill, fourth skill. Yes or yes. So I know some grandmasters, they've said, oh, I don't see any connection between chess and life. But for me, it's so obvious that it sort of makes me like, how can you not see it? Like, it's just, it's sort of as obvious as life itself, right? So anyway, I went on a little bit of a tangent, but I think it helps you to see just my own process and my own kind of growth that I went through on this uh, on this journey and how, you know, even when you just sign up for a proper program, that in itself gives you massive confidence because you, in a sense, put a bet on yourself in a way saying that, okay, I've made this big investment in myself, so I'd better make it work. But also in a way, making that step, taking the plunge, like it does position you really well to do that. I mean, I know for myself, like I've, joined a lot of high ticket group coaching programs myself. Uh, okay, not so much for chess admittedly, because they didn't really exist, uh, well, until myself and one of my chess colleagues started to do this thing in the last month or two. However, the thing is, I have been part of these high ticket coaching programs and other things like business. Actually, the certified high performance coaching I mentioned is one example where it taught me how to be a much more powerful and a much more effective coach. Uh, one big thing I took away, actually two big things I took away from that, uh, there are so many more, but just to single out the two biggest ones, I learned that a the role of a coach or trainer is to push, to challenge the student, and that is to challenge you to a much higher level, as it were. You're going to experience that, of course, in the program and a bit on the call as well. And the other key thing that I learned, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue, I had it in my, my mind a little bit earlier. Um, yeah, the second key thing I learned was also about how when you do make a certain investment in yourself, you will basically find the way to make it work. And it's kind of like a psychological principle because you know, back when I was doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching, I kind of, in hindsight, I can realize that you can be the best chess coach in the world, but if you don't have the right system, then the students are not going to progress that much, basically, is what I kind of realized. Yeah, that it also, you need to kind of be doing the right things yourself. And that's really what I'm covering in this training to show you, okay, these are the right elements to focus on and to give you a few ideas of like how to do it or what the rewards are of following through. Uh, which, by the way, leads me actually to the the fourth key component. And this one's pretty easy to remember, actually, because it's a follow-on from the, the first three. So just to remind you, the formula for chess mastery is one, practice, two, skill mastery, uh, three, self-mastery. And the fourth one is consistency. And consistency just simply means to continue following those first three steps. So that is to keep practicing, to keep on the skill mastery, to continue the journey of self-mastery as well. And the reality is that you can always get help in these areas, right? That if you ever get stuck or you feel like you're struggling, you can always reach out and ask me for support 
in my uh, program. So yeah, that's pretty much the the story. And I know I hope that you were taking some notes. I should have said that at the start of the video, but yeah, hopefully you were actually taking some notes and writing down some of the the valuable insights. Uh, well, what I'll do is I'm going to tell you one more time the four key elements for the formula for chess mastery, just to make sure that you've got it written down. Can you do that for me? All right. So the first one, the first part of the form for chess mastery is practice. The second element of chess mastery is skill mastery. The third part of the formula for chess mastery is self mastery. And the fourth element of formula for chess mastery is consistency. So that means doing the first three things I mentioned that you just wrote down to be doing those consistently every day until one day you wake up, you're a chess master. And well, I guess you'll be thanking me for, for the help, right? Uh, so in any case, that's the really what I want to share with you in this training. You know, like I have sort of mentioned, my philosophy in comes to coaching is about both giving you the chess skills to become a master, but also the self-mastery component as well, and to actually give you a academically proven, scientifically backed process to actually lead you through that growth that I, you know, kind of stumbled on by accident and figured out on my own, you know, not knowing what on earth I was doing as a teenager, but now you've just got the steps and it's just a matter of following. You know, obviously I can't, you know, do all of the steps for you. You've got to put that time in, but I give you all of the support that you need, you know, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, group, you know, messenger, you name it, in order to be able to execute those steps successfully. And, you know, reality is that on this journey, there are challenges, right? There will be times where you might feel like you're struggling a little bit or that you are a little bit stuck. And that's where having that coaching and that guidance to lead you to the next step really makes a, a big difference. Good or good? All right, that's pretty much all I think I want to share for, for this training. You know, I like to keep it simple. It is true, yeah, that originally I planned to make it a 20-minute uh, training, but, you know, is it all right if we over-deliver? All right, well, I really look forward to talking with you on the call. I know that, you know, you've got a fire to improve your chess. You know, you're really excited and you've got that level of commitment to, you know, get to the chess master level. Otherwise, you want to book the call. And I just want you to know that really my aim in this call is basically three things. The first thing is going to be to really kind of understand clearly what your problem is, the things that are kind of holding you back. The second thing is I want to kind of understand your goal more clearly. And okay, it's true when you're becoming a chess master. Yeah, this is obviously great. But I want to kind of understand more elements like, you know, why is that really important to you? And to, to kind of understand that on a deeper level. So that you're not just relying on motivation that ebbs and flows and wanes and whatever, but having actually a really powerful reason to commit and to make this uh, this journey a success for you. And the third thing we're going to I'm going to aiming to help you with in this uh, this call is basically to just to understand what the right next steps are for you because the reality is I don't accept just any student. It's important that you know that you are someone I can actually help that you're actually like the right kind of fit for you know for going through this process. Um, and that's really what the call is about as well just to make sure you are that right fit and to see if it makes sense for us to work together and for me to help you at the very highest level. Uh, but you know, you will know how the, the saying goes, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So I hope that you're now absolutely ready for this call and to make some more very positive steps in your journey to chess mastery. You're already on the right track. Let's keep up the good work and I will see you guys on the call. Take care.